Hello one, hello all, welcome to this episode of 1999 Best Movie Year Ever. This is August. I come to you as always as Charles or CP. Uh, chances are you aren't. Let's get to it. So August, traditionally, keep in mind 1999 fits within the pre-Marvel formula of cinematic ups and downs within a calendar year. And August traditionally, especially during 1999, would have been a year where you got a, a big start and then a, a steep fall off because college kids are going back to school. Some states, other kids are going to school uh, as early as early August. So it's, it's really weird to figure out what August is going to bring as far as the movie theater is concerned. August is like the summer's February, if that makes any sense. But no, no, not this one. We're gonna start recognizing a hell of a lot of heavy hitters, a hell of a lot of sleepers. And it, it turns out that August of 1999 was the second highest performing month of the year, which is unheard of. I mean, the years following, we, we called it the born month because it seemed like every time a born movie was released in August and always did Okay, not May, June, July, okay, but I digest. There's a bunch of things to cover here, and uh, we have multiple, multiple, multiple guests, so why don't we go ahead and get right into the nitty gritty. For reference, I'm going to be going non-linear for a myriad of reasons, but I, I will start with the first wide release of August on August 4th, the comedy known as Dick which was about a, a pair of girls who met up with Richard Nixon. Cause there's nothing more current, even in 1999, than that of Richard Nixon. Uh, I don't know who the audience was targeted, but a comedy named Dick came out. Of course I didn't see it. <laughs> Another movie which was an animated movie came out a few days later. It's been hailed as one of the greatest animated movies of all time. That of course being Iron Giant. Once again, strike out from good old Sipo. But I, I keep meaning to watch Iron Giant, but I have, I have seen the character in Ready Player One. I know those of you who are fans of this movie are probably puking in your coffee right now. Apologies. Keep in mind, I'm working at the movie theater. I'm a teenager. Uh, what, I, what I'm there to see is like stuff I wouldn't normally be allowed to see. Uh, ooh, what, what do we got? We got, you, you gotta go in and check out Titty Mansion with the hell, eyes wide shut. That was one I kept poking in on, no pun intended. So like when I'd look at the, the the release schedule, cartoon just just didn't blow up my trousers. But Eyes Wide Shut did. Another abnormal thing that you probably don't see very much anymore is four wide releases on the same day. August 6th was perhaps every studio's last hurrah and some suffered for it. And the, the one nobody saw coming absolutely obliterated. And that is Sixth Sense. And I have a non-movie YouTuber to tell us his story. He comes to us from the YouTube channel, Stay Metal Ray. And his name of course is Metal. No, no, uh, take it away, Ray. So in 1999, I was seven years old. I was in first grade, man. I was <laughs> real, real young, right? Um, so at the time, I obviously um, wasn't old enough to go to the theater by myself. And my parents, 
they're a little sheltered, you know, they sheltered me a little bit. They let me have some fun here and there, but uh, they uh, definitely didn't think I was old enough and mature enough to see the sixth sense in person. My father, however, thought it was a good idea to tell me about the movie. He went and saw it like opening night, we'll say, with his girlfriend at the time, and then came home and proceeded to dump the entire movie on me <laughs> via, you know, stories and just explaining what the movie was all about. Now, my dad wasn't um, a big time horror buff and he wasn't a, uh, a, a like a super fan, um, especially like the 80s slashers, like the Michaels, the Freddies, the Jasons. He thought that stuff was kind of corny and, uh, you know, rightfully so, right? But uh, whenever there was a horror movie that like he took seriously, I knew it was scary. I mean, the other example for me in my life was The Exorcist. He loved The Exorcist and he let me see that when I was eight years old. Um, he praised that movie. So he thought of The Sixth Sense again opening night the same way as he thought of like his favorite horror movies he thought it was a masterpiece he came home and he was just so amped and so jacked up to tell anybody about the movie and he lived alone and we were or i was visiting him for the time being whatever my parents were separated or divorced he came home from the movie and just proceeded to tell me about all these horrible <laughs> terrifying ghost sequences in the movie and he didn't spoil this the ending for me because he wanted to have me experience that ending whenever i was old enough um, i eventually saw it we rented it on vhs from west coast video in pennsylvania i'm um, about a year after it came out and i was able to witness the the ending myself i just remember him being so amped and being like yeah, so like there's this kid, right? And he just pops out of nowhere and you see him down the hallway and it gets real, real cold, right? And the dog goes off running and this kid in this like 70s style clothing, you don't know who he is. He just looks like a normal kid and he just says, hey, I'll show you where my dad keeps his gun. And he turns and his head's exploded off. And you know, it's you don't know what happened to this kid. He's obviously a ghost, but like either his dad shot him or he shot himself or something happened to this kid and like, you know, I don't know what happened and it was just so scary. Another time, uh, Cole, the little kid, goes to the bathroom in the middle of the night and the temperature starts dropping real, real cold and you see somebody walk by and in the kitchen is this lady with her wrist slit and says, no, your dinner's not ready. And like, I'm getting chills just right now just thinking about it. And I was like seven, dude. I was like, I was like watching Pokemon and uh, you know, Dragon Ball Z and like, my dad's telling me about all this. <laughs> <laughs> crazy stuff about these ghosts either harming themselves and or harming other people um, and he's just expecting me to you know pretend like I'm not seven <laughs> and not trying to learn you know how to like color within the lines for my homework or whatever like I'm a little kid man my dad was just a really passionate individual and uh, yeah he was just like brain dumping all of this information onto me about the sixth sense you know now looking back on the movie you know just who i am as a horror fan i'm a freddie michael jason fanatic and i'm not really like an m night Shyamalan fan or a bruce willis fan really or a um Haley joe osmond fan like i don't i'm not really a fan of any of those people but that movie just really stands out for me not only for the nostalgia of my dad coming home and just telling me all about it it just reminds me of just being a kid but it also just like that's like the one example of like m night Shyamalan actually being scary you know i'm not really a fan of his movies i'll be honest um they're they're solid and they're you know for the most part put together pretty well but like that one really just stands out for me it's just like the one movie that actually scared me. It scares me to this day. You know, there's something to be said about that style of movie where there's very little jump scares. It's all about just what you see and, and or what you don't see. I mean, something as simple as like the lady on the bike outside the window. There's no jarring jump scare. There's no loud music. She's just all of a sudden there with blood down her face and like just kind of just like walks or rides away or whatever. Like terrifying stuff. And it's in the middle of the day, you know, broad daylight. That's terrifying, dude. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, really dark and, you know, just a jump scare and loud music like modern day horror does it. Just practical effects, just real subtle. It's really, really good stuff, man. Um, again, another, I'm kind of rambling here, but I'm just really passionate about this movie. Another example of just practical, simple scare is um, when the mom leaves the room and then comes back and all the cabinets are wide open for no reason. You know, no jump scare, no loud noise, middle of the day, you know, morning time. And that's terrifying dude it's really really terrifying and it's really effective so that movie holds a special place in my heart because it's really terrifying really creepy from beginning to end the opening is really unsettling 
The ending's phenomenal. Like, what a twist. Really, really great horror movie. A really suspenseful movie. And um, it just really reminds me of being a kid and having that nostalgia attached to, you know, my father's memory. Uh, he passed away several years ago now, like six years ago. Um, but I, always rem I will always remember him telling me how excited he was about The Sixth Sense as a six-year-old or a seven-year-old little kid. And uh, it's a really good memory for me to have. And uh, I'm just really thankful that that movie even exists because it allows me to have that memory and think of my dad even to this day. So, CP, thank you so much for having me on your channel, man. That's my first ever movie review, and uh, I wanted to talk about The Sixth Sense, so thank you so much again, dude. I really appreciate you, and it was an honor to be on your channel. I experienced Sixth Sense far more as an employee of a movie theater than I did because I didn't see it opening night. Ushers, we used to wait out of the exit 30 seconds to a minute before the movie ended to say goodbye because companies thought that was some sign of courteous and that was gonna welcome you back another time, even though they have nothing to do with the production. So as we would wait for Sixth Sense to end, there was something going on and you could, you could tell just by them leaving that, you know, you, you could tell like the sound of people leaving a theater usually picks up, people start talking and whatever. Uh, back then somebody would, would put a cigarette in their mouth, get ready to, fucking get their their fix uh but sixth sense was always at least like 60 percent just stunned silence and it was it was like a like a an event we, we knew that it was a big deal i had a bunch of event movies happen in 1999 uh blair witch project was my army training so to speak as far as the movie theaters and employees concerned but the sixth sense uh, after seeing it, I, I certainly, instead of going to, to wait for the, the goodbyes, please come back, how much garbage did you leave for us to clean thing, I, I would figure out when the reveal would happen. And that's when I would duck into the theater to hear the, uh, the gasps, the, the like, it, it genuinely was like, you, you could feel the room just kind of like suck out and realize, oh shit, this, this thing just happened. Um, which I, I won't spoil, <laughs> even though we're more than 20 years after the fact, but it was, it, it's another thing where the theater experience far exceeds something you do renting a movie with a couple of friends. Not saying that that's not, uh, a great thing but in that moment it was it was an event watching people and 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 hearing the crowd because six cents was a, a big deal it was like the heaviest hitter in august you know word of mouth spread a little bit slower than it does today so you know the, the crowd started growing bigger and bigger and bigger and sure enough that that end there was always that that at least half the audience was just in a hush trying to process what the hell it was they did. And it was fun hearing like the younger, usually it was like teenage girls trying to process, but wait a minute, there was this thing with the, and, and it was just, it was just fun. So like after knowing what happened and, and hearing the minor trying to retread things in the movie and, uh, you know, that, that's a, a perfect example of what I call a doggy bag movie. Something that you watch, you go home, and you keep talking about it. Also released on August 6th was The Thomas Crown Affair, which was a remake, which starred Pierce Brosnan and Rene Russo. Also Dennis Leary. This movie was good. I think this was the movie I saw opening weekend when Sixth Sense came out. All I remember is Rene Russo's dress Keep in mind, I'm a teenager. Like ev everything down here is just raging. It was it was a really really great heist movie, and and then Rene Russo wore a dress where you're like, wait, is that? I think I just no that. Uh, is she wearing a flesh colored dress under? Ah, uh, and that alone was enough to drive a young buckling crazy. Um, I've spoken nothing about the film and uh, mostly about Rene Russo's dress. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it was one of the last great 
Pierce Brosnan movies. I guess I could say the same thing for for Rene Russo as well. Uh, they, they both kind of teetered off after that. Uh, in the comments section, if you, if you can name me something that, that was on par or better than Thomas Crown Affair that either of them were in after 1999, uh, I'm, I'm eager to hear it. But uh, there's a reason this movie kind of got destroyed between Sixth Sense and The Iron Giant. Uh, a week later on August 13th, Steve Martin and Eddie Murphy started a film together and Eddie Murphy had made a couple of duds by that point. This film appeared to be his his reclamation project. It is doofy, it's silly. Steve Martin plays a huckster where he's he's trying to get a movie made and I think he goes to Robert Downey Jr. with his script and Robert Downey Jr. says, I'm not doing it without Kip, whatever Eddie Murphy's name was in the movie. So they do this guerrilla style filmmaking where they're like, they have lines, but Eddie Murphy, his character doesn't know that they're doing a movie and he's just like, what, what, what are these people talking about? And it starts freaking him out to where he starts seeing a therapist and ultimately, majestically, there's somebody who looks just like Eddie Murphy and Steve Martin casts him as more of a, a stunt double and then some. He's, he's also crew. There's somebody that he gets the coffee and that's like his most important job that he takes the most pride in. And it's funny because Hollywood loves to suck itself off. No pun intended. What's the word I'm looking for to not piss off everybody in Hollywood? Well, they had a lot of what people do to get to the top. Uh, Heather Graham's character essentially was the pretty actress who, whoever was succeeding that time, that was her boyfriend at the time. And it, you know, it, it kind of plays into everything that is unraveling now for Hollywood or, or the world. This is a Me Too warning film. The fact that, you know, this movie was a comedy. People thought it was hysterical. Nobody thought twice about what was happening there. Ha ha, oh, uh, girl just sleeping around to get a good part. Oh, oh, Hollywood. All distasteful matters aside, Bowfinger was a, a, a quite an enjoyable movie that I would assume a lot of people have at least as their favorite Eddie Murphy movie from the late 90s, perhaps even early 2000s. This might, if you take like 1995 to 2005, I could probably argue that Bowfinger is his best movie of that little decade. Also released on August 13th was another movie that takes place in 1978 based on a, on a group of kids that are trying to go see Kiss. What is your target audience? Because Kiss wasn't exactly top in the charts in 1999. It would make more sense if they were going to a, I don't know, Lincoln Park concert. Like, take the, the same script, adapt it a little bit, uh, and Bob's your uncle. But Kiss, who were the producers of this film, take note of that, members of Queen an actual story built around these kids trying to get tickets to see a KISS show. KISS wasn't but, what, 10, 15 minutes of the movie? And I have somebody to talk about it. Cody? When I was 10 years old uh, in the summertime, I actually went and stayed with my grandfather for two weeks. It was a, a, he had a country house, he had horses. It was way different culture shock than what I was used to growing up in Ohio. And so every single time that we would go visit, me, my dad, and usually my little brother, I always had such a blast. And so whenever he was talking about going to visit him once again in the summer coming up, and brought up the idea that if I wanted to, I could stay there. He was just gonna be there for a weekend and I could stay for a couple weeks and my dad would come back and get me later on in the summer. And I was so excited for that prospect, but I had never been away from home before. And so there was maybe, 
I'll give myself six days so I don't feel like such a bitch, but it might have been four or five into these two weeks that I was without my father and without my brother, just alone with my grandfather and my cousin that I did not have a very strong relationship with. I got so homesick to the point where I could not even answer a phone call from my father or my grandmother without crying. <laughs> and so it was bad. But one of the saving graces that I had was that my uh, my grandfather had HBO and Cinemax and uh, Stars or whatever else was available back in uh, in 2000. And there was two movies that I discovered by just watching his HBO channel and they were Major Pain and Detroit Rock City. And Detroit Rock City was the one that, because it was so raunchy, but because it was also just bathed in 80s rock, 80s metal, uh, had one of the best soundtracks ever, and I was a big fan of Kiss when I was a kid as well, so I fell in love with this movie, and I probably watched it in, in variations of length, because it was always started at different points when I noticed it was on HBO about eight or nine times during the, this week and a half that I started to become really homesick. And it instantly became one of my favorite comedies. I, I love the dynamic of the four characters. Uh, I love the journey that they go on. There are four separate ways to try to get these tickets. I think that the comedy in it is, is really strong and still holds up really well. But man, that soundtrack was awesome. Hey, peanut turds. I'm here for the girl in the car. I was still not completely versed in rock. I was still like a couple years into my transition from boy band shit into uh, Alice Cooper and Metallica and all of that. So I discovered Van Halen and some other stuff. And so I remember my dad specifically getting really uh, happy and just laughing on the drive home whenever he finally came to pick me up and then running with the devil or something would come on the radio and I would know the words, running with the devil. And he's like, oh, learned a little bit of Van Halen, are we? So uh, Detroit Rock City always has memories of me, not only just as a great comedy that I love revisiting, but it was like a comfort movie for me for a long time because at, at that very vulnerable, sad time in my life where I was just crippled by homesickness, that was one of a handful of movies that gave me comfort and made the time pass so much better. And last but not least, we're going right back to August 6th to talk about a comedy that was released that really kind of got got buried. Uh, again, that, that week of the 6th, uh, few survived, and, and Sixth Sense just, just ate everybody's lunch. I have another guest, Cineram, take it away. Hello, I'm Scott. Uh, my channel is called Cineram, and I'm very, very pleased that CP is having me on for his 1999 series. This month is August, and so I asked to do the film Mystery Men, which is an ensemble comedy and a superhero parody movie, uh, which came out that year, directed by Kinka Usher, who directed commercials, and that's it. No other feature films. <laughs> uh, this is the only feature film he's ever done. So really, the draw here is the actors, the ensemble of comedic actors, and the writing. Ben Stiller is the top billed star. He had uh, some big success recently with There's Something About Mary the year before, and he would have more success with Meet the Parents in the next year. But uh, he's uh, got a, there's a huge cast basically in this movie. You got Paul Rubens, Gene Garofalo, Hank Azaria, uh, Greg Kinnear, the dude, uh, William Mace Macy, sorry. Huh? Also, Jeffrey Rush, uh, who played Barbarossa in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. He was the villain in this movie, Casino of Frankenstein. And he gets released from the mental hospital, from the uh, uh, asylum that he's been locked up in at the behest of a billionaire businessman named Lance Hunt. Of course, Lance Hunt is the alter ego for Captain Amazing, the leading superhero of the town that this film takes place in, Champion City, because Captain Amazing doesn't have any more villains to fight. <laughs> he's put them all away or killed them or whatever, you know, and he's in danger of basically losing support from his corporate sponsors uh, if he doesn't have a bigger, more popular, more exciting supervillains to fight. So he orchestrates the release of Casino Frankenstein, but then it backfires on him, he gets captured, and then it's up to these lower tier heroes who really don't have a lot of fighting skills and don't have the money 
and the technology behind them. And they're basically just guys who are going out late at night fighting bad guys wherever they can after their day jobs are finished. The trio, the main trio of guys, is played by Ben Stiller, William H. Macy, and uh, Hank Azaria. And they each have their little gimmick where, they, where, they, where they're fighting guys in their own style. And then they decide that, you know, it, it would be probably a good idea if we got more people on our team so we'd have a better chance against some of these bad guys. So they uh, throw a barbecue and they invite a whole bunch of superheroes and other, other sort of part-time superheroes like themselves to audition to be part of their team. And that's when they get Cal Thompson as the Invisible Boy and Gene Garofalo as the Bowler and uh, the Spleen, played by Paul Rubens, AKA Pee Wee Herman. And so they're really filling out their ranks um, but they still need a lot of help, and so they get help from a mentor character played by Wes Studi. And he's sort of making fun of the wise mentor character, like Mr. Miyagi, uh, says funny things like, if you uh, doubt your powers, you give power to your doubts. And every single thing that he says is basically like the first, second half of his sentence is a reversal of the first half. But he is really good in this. It's fun to see him uh, play, you know, and have a sort of a comic twist on his usual persona. But my favorite performance in the movie is uh, from Greg Kinnear as Captain Amazing. He's very, very arrogant. He's just, he's, he's really, really funny, really funny character, and he's great in it. And, um, you know, most of the ensemble I really like a lot. I've been a fan of Gene Garofalo for a long time. And I know that uh, CP kind of wanted uh, us to bring a personal story when we, you know, sort of guest on these videos right here. And honestly, in 1999, I was seeing lots of movies by myself. I went, I took my mom to see The Phantom Menace uh, earlier that summer. But aside from that, most of the time I would go see movies like twice a week and I'd just be on my own, just whenever appealed to me. Um, however, um, just a couple of years ago, a friend of mine said that he had never seen Mystery Men before. So I'm like, ooh, we have to watch it. So let's make it a double feature. I went over to his place and he showed me Stripes, which I had never seen before. And then I showed Mystery Men and he laughed a lot during Mystery Men. And uh, after it was over, I asked him which film he liked better. He says, well, I like Stripes better, but I understand that because Stripes is a longtime favorite of his, whereas Mystery Men is you know, a longtime favorite of mine. So naturally I like that more, but it's it's really funny. There's a lot of really great character moments. Ben Stiller, his whole shtick basically is he gets really angry. And so he's looking for excuses to get angry so that he can throw and fly into a rage and fight things or people and uh, and just doesn't work most of the time. It's it's, it's really, really hilarious. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, overall really strong movie, lots of fun. Um, really not released at the right time, you know, it should have been come out a, a while later in order to be successful. But you know, it, we could all enjoy it now at least. Um, and I hope that you do if you haven't seen it already. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you very much to CP for having me on, appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, more recommendations from other people from this year. Take it easy. Mystery Men was a movie that, uh, it, it's like it's like Scott said, it really didn't have a blueprint to succeed. Light fared comedy that was kind of mocking the superhero thing. And if they made this movie, I don't know, 10 years later, <laughs> Who knows what could have happened, but releasing a movie like this in August just just buried it. And the, oddly enough, I didn't discover this movie until years later because a comedian named Dane Cook was in it and he was the waffler. Uh, he has a two second part in the movie and um, watched the movie and, and I too thought it was a little goofy. I don't know what part of the year you would have released that in. It, it seems comedies seem to work well in like a February to March, April. I, I, I don't know. It. it I can't explain. There's two elements that I can't explain how how they do and do not succeed, and and depending on the comedy, comedy is one of them, and depending on the horror, horror is another one where like, all right, what what are the details? What's the plot? How's the marketing? I can't tell you anything about how this is gonna do. But I, I, it was it was August where I started getting an appreciation for for multiple elements of the movie making industry, <laughs> and I'm not talking about Bowfinger. The the reactions to Sixth Sense, you know, seeing it in person that that people can be affected that much by a movie, like it, it 
you know, witnessing it firsthand, it, it was, it was perhaps it was the seed that was planted. 1999 was a big year for me that really started progressing things to, to what I wanted to do with myself. And uh, perhaps, perhaps that sixth sense reaction was just a little seed. But that'll do it for August. September's coming. Special thanks to my patrons for supporting the show. Uh, you can help the show without being a patron by commenting, throwing those thumbs, sobbing, uh, hitting the bell to be notified of one more of this shit is coming. And uh, next up, we got some, the beginning of pumpkin latte spice macchiato season. September's coming. You excited? I've been CP. You haven't.